This is Jonathan Ferguson, the Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armies Museum in the UK, which houses a collection of thousands of iconic weapons from throughout history. And on this episode, he's going to be checking out the armory of the Milsim shooter, Armour 3, a game that he was quite impressed with. This is probably the most detailed in-game model of an AKM I have ever seen. If there are any other games, guns and mechanics that you guys want to see Jonathan break down, let us know in the comment section below. Be sure to subscribe for more videos like this one, and if you'd like to help out the Royal Armies Museum and continue to support Jonathan's work, check out the links in the description of this video. Right, over to Jonathan. Got a quite a nice representation of the G36 within the limitations of the uh, the graphics engine, of course, it's quite well done. The I know, do notice that the ammunition is quite nicely. There's attention to detail there. You can see there's a, there's a defined. I don't know if it's the cannula or, or the or the lacquer or something, but I, you can see the bullet is a separate entity to the cartridge case. Normally, ammunition is an afterthought in in games, especially uh, games a few years old. It's something you don't see for, uh, for very long, gets overlooked, and I, I think this being quite a high intensity detail milsim style game i think that's why they've represented the ammunition the way they have cartridge cases though looked a little bit procedural in the sense of they don't seem to be coming out organically due to that relationship between extractor and ejector cartridge cases tend to spin well they do spin out but here they do look a bit old school video game where they come out perfectly perpendicular to the gun as usual i'm being extremely picky here because that's kind of my job heard quite a lot of good things about sniping in the armor games the way it's set up to allow for the various factors that you have to consider the rifles implemented pretty well for its native role of proper sniping at long distance it seems to behave as it ought to something i noticed there though in using it close up as you might have to if you're ambushed the the weapon model doesn't move when it's being operated now that's completely to be expected if it's if you're in the prone position the bipod's deployed the thing is it's a, the butt is in your shoulder then you're not going to see any movement of the rifle but if you're holding it at a sort of low ready looking over the sights as you'd have to do if you were shooting at this close distance then inevitably the the gun is going to move some as you cock it this is a milsim type game but i expect every little detail of um, military detail to be there but i don't necessarily expect naturalistic physics of how everything moves around if that makes sense so I'm not put off if player characters rotate on the spot without moving their feet, for example, and the same would apply to this weapon model. It looks as it should. It looks reasonably weathered and camouflaged. Yeah, so the third person view reveals a bit of a quirk. When the weapon is loaded, the player is doing what you'd expect, pushing forward, locking the bolt into position. But in firing, between shots, there doesn't appear to be any actual bolt cycling going on. The bolt kind of just drifts out and goes back into battery on its own. That's clearly not deliberate. I'm guessing that with a, a, an expansive, detailed simulation game like this, it's just something that's been overlooked. The Israeli Tavor 21 version in the game is almost the same, or rather this is almost the same as the version in the game. The only difference, the optical sight arrangements here. So as introduced to the Israeli Defense Force, it looked like this. And you had these flip up rear iron sights, which you can actually, well, flip up front and rear iron sights, co-witnessed through the optical sight. So the aperture in the front post coincide with the red dot. So if this breaks or it's too dark and the daylight powered scope isn't working, then you can use the, the iron sights on the gun. Um, what we see here is the effectively the export version where that's been replaced by a strip of um, Picatinny rail and the rear sight arrangements have changed so that they're part of this new system. So this, this whole section here changed. Other than that, this is as introduced. The thing that stuck out for me though is the grenade launcher on this thing. There is an IWI underbarrel grenade launcher module for the Tavor. It's not this. This looks basically identical to the FN underbarrel grenade launcher for that's fitted for the F2000 or the SCAR. 
kind of weird to see one company's grenade launcher on another at this point. We also see a bit of a quirk of, I think, the game in that that grenade launcher has a big ring trigger, double action mechanism, and you pull on that ring trigger to fire it. That's not what's happening in the clip. Effectively, the player is switching between the firearm and the grenade launcher and firing the grenade launcher off the rifle's trigger, which is almost unheard of, other than for designed bespoke solutions like the OICW, where you've built that in from the outset and it's electro electrically linked. Generally speaking, the same trigger for a destructive device, effectively, and a rifle is a bad idea for safety reasons. Okay, I gather this game is set some years, some decades, into the future, so we would expect to see some high-tech types, and this thing certainly is. This is the General Dynamics take on the lightweight medium machine gun, which is one of these experimental US projects that's still ongoing. Now, I'm looking here at a first-person view. We've got... We've got the gun, we've got the optic, all looks very good, and then we've got the ammunition. Always pleasing to see actual case head markings depicted, even if it's a flat texture. And if my screen was a bit sharper, I'm sure I could read 0.338 Norma Magnum. Norma Magnum is not a sort of glam grandmother. It is in fact, <laughs> uh, Norma is a, a Swedish manufacturing, ammunition manufacturing design company. And it's that's their take, if you like, on a 338 Magnum cartridge, which is this perfect, almost perfect sweet spot between 762 NATO and 50 Browning machine gun. Reload there looked good, except for one glaringly obvious Law. Now, I happened to be looking in the wrong place at first, but I was still aware that the top cover had magically passed through a substantial part of the scope. So, account has not been taken of which optical sight you have fitted to your gun. The animation takes place regardless of that. But that reflects a very real issue in actual use as well, because if you did fit a scope of, this, of these proportions, to this weapon, well, it won't clip through, you won't be able to open it. You'd have to take the scope off, well, they'd have to be provision on that mounting platform to pivot it out of the way. So I think what we're seeing here is a not quite a freak situation. This is something you'd obviously, if you were adopting this particular configuration, you'd have to take account of it and not issue this optic. That's where the freedom of a video game meets the harsh reality of the military is you get what you're issued. Now this thing is a beast. The GM6 Lynx, which is the rifle we're talking about here, by the Hungarian firm Gepard. The, the power level of this thing is pretty off the scale. It's available in 50 Browning machine gun, but also 127 by 108 which is the Dushka machine gun round, the Russian equivalent. And in terms of destructive effect, we saw it used against uh, what we call a technical, a, a soft-skinned vehicle used in a paramilitary context. Uh, often they'll have a machine gun on the back or a recoilless rifle or something like that. This thing will absolutely destroy the engine with a single shot of a vehicle like that. The bonnet provides absolutely no protection at all. Well, chances are you're going to do something, some serious damage to that engine. If it doesn't stop running immediately, it will stop very soon, which is really what it's for. Uh, it's not really a sniper rifle. It's primarily for disabling vehicles and aircraft. Not usually aircraft in the air. Not to say it couldn't be done, but that's not normally how you do it. You get them when they're not moving. It's a lot easier. So these weird looking red cartridges, I and mean, there's no particular reason why caseless ammunition would be red. Truly caseless ammunition, the case is made up of the propellant, and so it's burned up in the firing, and there's nothing to extract or eject. The fired primer gets blown out of the front of the gun. This gun's not designed to fire caseless ammunition, it would have to be a completely different gun to fire caseless ammunition. Even if I'm missing something here, and this is meant to be case telescopes, again, the, the design changes needed 
you'd be looking at a completely different gun that might look similar. Peering at those rounds, I can't, I, it does look like there's a rim on there. So maybe this is meant to be some super resilient propellant case material that does have an extractor groove on it. And therefore the gun can be rechambered for this. What I, what I will give them though, is the way it's depicted does seem consistent with the way the real world gun performs. The ability to keep the weapon on target as the player moves forward. We've seen with the other machine gun in the game, jumping around all over the place, this thing is staying pretty much where you're pointing it. So there's the clear gameplay benefit of this weapon, which is also its real world benefit. The issue in the real world, I think, is that it's a great machine gun, probably one of the best on the market, but the ones everyone's got right now are probably good enough. Now this is a fascinating video game gun because it's not real. And I'm sure all of you armor players are well aware of that. Those of you who aren't might have looked at it and gone, is that an ACR? Is that a, an XCR? Is that some sort of CR that we're looking at there? Uh, no, not exactly. It's an original design by the American arms manufacturer CMMG, who are known for their AR-15 variants, that they, I had to look this up. <laughs> because <laughs> I didn't know what this was. They designed it for the game, but it doesn't exist in real life. I think it's a paper gun that has been designed in collaboration with a real-world firearms manufacturer for a video game, and I don't know of any other instance of this happening. I sort of have some mixed feelings about this gun. On the one hand, as a sort of video game phenomenon, it's um, it's quite fascinating. But as a player, I think it would distract the heck out of me to have, as a sort of standard issue, a fictional firearm. Even though it's very grounded in reality. They haven't pushed the envelope here really with technology at all. It is generic in the sense of a sort of present day assault rifle design. Right, anti-tank weapons. I'm much more of a small arms person than I am light weapons, but that is the N-Law, the, not anymore really, but a next generation light anti-tank weapon. This looks pretty good, and in terms of its ability to take out that vehicle, fair enough. The only slight eyebrow raise was the reload. Uh, now again, I think we're looking at, you don't normally play these games from a third person view, so it's maybe a bit unfair to critique the, the external angle here, but there was a um, an invisible munition being pulled out of the backpack there and just kind of wafted into the back end of the, the launcher. So uh, very much a, f a fudged reload. Not having fired one of these things, I don't actually know what the first person view ought to look like, but that looks reasonable to me. This is, after all, a true missile launcher. It's not um, a weird hybrid like the RPG. It's not a recoilless weapon, and it's not a simpler rocket launcher either. It is a true guided missile launcher. So we actually see the missile, we see its exhaust trail in the optical site as it flies away. So anyone that has used one of these in the military, let us know how realistic you think it looks. Okay, I think the first thing I have to get off my chest is just how terribly wrong a long barreled P90 looks. Now I know, I know there's a PS90 with the long barrel, which is a, a legal thing there's no almost no real reason no tactical reason to have the long barrel on a p90 when you see the long barreled ones it's because it's a, a legal slash financial issue so it's a little it's, it's a little straight well strange in two ways to have this in the game at all frankly firstly that the p90 is already a niche weapon and in very limited military use because it's its cartridge is insufficiently powerful for, for infantry type fighting so that's reason one is it surprised to see this in use in 20 years in a straight up military context especially in this open terrain that we see here now to give the developers credit that is reflected quite nicely in the way the weapon performs on screen there so that was about 300 maybe even a bit further meters away so classical assault rifle engagement distances infantry rifle and the player was struggling there even with the magnified optic to actually make contact with the enemy that they were shooting at that's entirely what we'd expect we've got the unrealism of it being in the game in this context counterbalanced by the realism of it being depicted really quite well. Now having said that, it does have that long barrel on it which would perhaps give you a bit more in terms of velocity, perhaps a bit more accuracy at distance as a result. But then why have you got the long barrel on there in the first place on what's supposed to be a submachine gun? So it's a little bit of a conflicted one for me.
It's our old friend, the Kalashnikov AK. In this case, the AKM, the modernized AK, introduced in 1959, and at this point, pretty much the most common. This is probably the most detailed in-game model of an AKM I have ever seen. Lots of detail there in the 3D model itself. So much so that I'm able to nitpick <laughs> tiny details like the front of the gas block here. It might be the angle, it might be me, but I don't think so. This is an AKM gas block. So note the ramp here and the shape of the front. The gas block on this rifle is much more AK pattern, so the earlier version. When you do this good a job on, a, on an in-game gun, this is your reward. You get nitpicked. <laughs> if I wasn't looking at a front right quarter view of this thing, I would not have spotted that. The Scorpion, another submachine gun. This is a bit of a surprise, as all submachine guns in a military shooter are, because they are now a kind of a niche thing. This is the Scorpion, the CZ Scorpion, although the design is not an in-house one. This was designed by Jan Lukanski. No relation to the similarly named smaller submachine gun slash machine pistol. The rate of fire took me aback. I thought that's far too high, but um, having checked, no, that's exactly as it's supposed to be. So um, I guess being a straight blowback design um, without some way of slowing down the bolt, you tend to get up above the thousand rounds per minute mark. Useful for certain applications, a problem for others. But in this scenario, out, outdoors, shooting across open terrain, you want a rifle, really. This thing is absolutely ridiculous. There are no two ways around it. I have reached my limit of fictional near future military kit. This is nonsense. So from the top, type 115 implies China pretty much. And I gather from context that, that, is, that there is a Chinese involvement here. And, it, and aesthetics wise as well, it does look reminiscent of Chinese designs. And that's where it all goes wrong, as far as I'm concerned, because we've got 6.5 caseless, which doesn't exist in any military supply train today and isn't likely to, even in 20 years' time, I wouldn't have said, but that's a relatively minor issue. Over and under with a 50 Beowulf firearm. So you've got the, all the advantages of, of caseless ammunition, lightweight, and then about the heaviest cased ammunition, pound for pound, for its effectiveness that you could possibly have come up with. It's not even 50 BMG to give you some sort of a under barrel anti-materiel capability. That might have made some sense. Giving you an inferior rifle cartridge to complement your superior rifle cartridge doesn't make a lick of sense. And as we can see here, if you suppress your upper barrel, I think that's the upper barrel, your other barrel is very loud. So you've negated the advantage of caseless, you've negated the advantage of suppression, and you've massively negated the advantage of a lightweight modern combat rifle because you've chimeraed two guns together. I am not a fan, as if you couldn't tell. <laughs> Of course, join us again next time on this series. If you'd like to, head over to the Royal Armouries YouTube channel. We have some, some extra content over there. And we've got links in the description of this video for ways that you can support the Royal Armouries Museum as we move into the future. Thanks, guys.